cold. <laughs> it's really cold. It's about minus two, early morning. Give us a second, I'm trying to act all cool, right? I need to get my jacket on. Let me do that before we say hello. Ridgeline people, Ridgeline. New Zealand company, I think they are. Really good jacket. It's a smock, warm as hell. Tight fitting. There's one problem with this and you'll see that in a second. Apart from my hair's being all over it. Start getting into a straight jacket. <laughs> so tight fitting. One second. I'll be with you in a second. How do you bloody get your arms through? Here you go. Oh my god. Oh. Let the hair out. Oh, that's it. Oh, finally. Sorry about that, people. How do I look? Looking good, apart from the nose. I found with the nose, if I do it this angle, it doesn't look too bad. If I do it that angle, you can see like the three different curvatures that are going on. People who are into geometry will have a feel there with my nose. Friends, what is going on? It's been ages. How are you doing? I forgot my normal intro. What was my normal intro? It's been that long. Let me do the cuffs up. It's been a while, huh? My apologies for the absence slightly. I've been so busy with work. I run my own business. Fortunately, it takes precedence over everything. Everything I do with this channel is a big, big passion of mine. Don't even call it a hobby, it's a big passion of mine. So it's just something that, you know, um, I do when and as I get time. But obviously, back into the flow now. Hope you've all keep, been keeping well. Very, very belated. Happy Christmas and Happy New Year's. Beginning of February, winter. Winter is definitely here in the UK, for UK standards anyway. So, we're back at the base camp, and I've actually got a couple of friends of mine who uh, you may not have seen before. In fact, I don't think you have seen before, Paul and Phil. And um, they've come down very kindly to help me out. So basically, just a few things we want to do to take the base camp, because it's been a while since I've been here. Number one, we're going to do a clean up of the entire area. Uh, as you're going to see shortly, um, man, it's like deadfall everywhere. It's been really bad. We've had a lot of storms and heavy winds in the UK in recent months. It's been quite bad. So there's a lot of deadfall. So one of my buddies, Phil, who's uh, savvy with a chainsaw and obviously trained up, he's going to help us kind of like trim everything down, clear the area up, clearing a couple of dangerous trees. I need to take a load of measurements down in order to re uh, source all the materials for the rest of the build and a few bits and bobs. So, brought the camera along for you to join us. Today's a much of a uh, consolidation day to kind of get the base camp ready and then I can power forward with the actual build. So, hope you enjoy the rest of the video. So here we go, it's my buddy Phil. Phil, appreciate Hello. you coming down. Look at that, he's looking the part, man, with his chainsaw. There's a good buddy of mine, Paul. Paul, how you doing? Morning. Appreciate you coming, the guys coming down to help. You're welcome. So here we go, here we've got obviously the structure from before. So we're doing a clear up of the area, but as you can see, right in front of the shelter, we've got these trees here, and we're on the verge of coming down. Because of the storms, there's been a lot of trees falling over there, which is not good. So we're going to take these two down, which are the obvious ones, which are leading away from the shelter. And this one's a little bit precarious, it might be out of our remit, but we're going to see how that goes. At the very least, we need to clear these. As you can see here, look, it's rotted all the way from the bottom. That's on the verge of collapsing. So there you go, that's what we're going to do. Hopefully get that down first. So here we go, this is the chestnut piece. Look at the grain on that, absolutely stunning. So this big piece there, big diameter is chestnut. We're actually gonna salvage a lot of it for future carving. And this thinner piece over here is birch, and obviously that's gonna be amazing for spoons and cutlery and all sorts of shenanigans. But like I said, this one here, see this one here, it's a little bit precarious. See that's the way it's leaning over, the shelter. That's why it's a bit iffy, but it might be a little bit out of our remit cutting this one down. We might need to get an 
someone with the other gadgets and probably cording stuff like ropes and stuff, you know, to kind of angle the drop. But we're just looking at that grain structure, absolutely stunning. here we go guys all done the area looks much much better this is the only tree like I said we've had to leave for the moment but that's going to take more specialized equipment to remove that safely um, but that's all cleaned up we cleared up all the brush from around there uh, we've done all that obviously it's a shelter so now what we've done we've piled everything up so let me tell you what we've got this is all birch so this is all freshly felled birch all this is useful all this is going to come and use for carving so that's not going to go to waste um, this is all wood, partly kind of like this is going to be seasoned, some of it, then uses firewood, some of it's already dry, but most of it's going to be left to season for quite a while. Most of it's hardwood, which is fantastic. This is chestnut, so this is going to be used for carving once again. That's all still going to be used up. This is all still very much green and damp, but all this is going to season up over the coming months and over the year or so, and that's going to be amazing firewood. This is all the brush that we've piled up. Um, and these are just some loose bits over there and there you go that's it so we've done an amazing job actually um, the chainsaw made quick work of all of that and the main thing is we removed all the dangerous stuff that was a part that was worrying me like I said because of the storms and stuff you can see stuff has fallen look just in front of the camp there there's a fallen piece of birch there so obviously the birch is a lot more weaker a lot more prone to falling over but so far so good so I'm much happier with this So as you can hear, from the noise on the tarp, the good old British weather has kicked in. So lashing it down with rain. So we've got the tarp up, got a fire going, we've got the all important brew to get on. Oh, this is the always the precarious bit, trying to balance it without it falling over. There you go, that should do. So that's it, water's on the boil, rain, gotta love the rain now, British weather. So it's a good thing we've got the tarp up, the main thing is we've got the site cleared up now of all the deadfall, anything looking dangerous, all the brush and everything, it's all piled up nice and neat. So what we're going to do now, we're going to chill out here for a little bit, hopefully when the rain clears up, a couple of things I want to finish off. Um, and I hope you've all been keeping well, I know you've been patient with me when it comes to this build, but like I said, today really was about just kind of get myself back into the mode again with the base camp, what it is I've got to do. I've got to take some measurements to then get the materials over the next couple of weeks to finish off the build. Um, and it's good to come back. One thing I was mentioning earlier to the guys that were sitting here is that it's amazing, and obviously it's winter now, literally in the middle of winter, that you can see right through the woodland because all the leaves and brush and everything's completely gone. Uh, and it's weird, you know, like during the summer and the spring, obviously everything's uh, alive, you know, obviously all the vegetation is up, um, and you can just about see like 20, 30 metres ahead of you. Now, honestly, you can just see all the way through. It's amazing, isn't it, how everything changes at one woodland throughout all the seasons. State of the obvious, I know, but hey, it's just really, really cool to watch. And now the classic scene of smoke getting in my eyes. So I'm not getting emotional, but I'm I'm not getting emotional talking to you guys after so long, although that is emotional as well. Um, <laughs> it's the smoke, just as I start talking. I even moved my chair because the smoke was going that way, and now it's coming in my face. Thank you, smoke. This video was brought to you by Costa. Costa, the world won't be the same without you, my friend. That's it, right, that's it. One sugar. I guess I'm sweet enough. So, Mr. Robinson. Hello. Here I am with my my metal metal artificial mass-produced cup, and you're with your beautiful, beautiful hand-carved mug here. And you turned that yourself, didn't you? Yep. Turn it on a bowl, eh? 
And how does that differ from a normal pole lathe? The difference is it's a lot more sturdy. Right. Due to the forces and pressures and things. And the angle of the, um, of the tool rest. Right. Mm. And what wood is this made out of then? This is a piece of birch. That's beautiful. It's a real chunky feeling for that, isn't it? Just like me. Oh, <laughs> that's what Hugh says. <laughs> So there we go friends, the rain has actually stopped, it was raining for quite a while. Pat the tarp away, put the fire away responsibly, leave no trace. And my friends Phil and Paul, they've left. A huge thanks to both of you, I could not thank you enough for helping me out. Um, and so those guys are gone now, now the site's cleaned up, we've finished off cleaning the site up, organised the wood into piles. And um, I just want to apologise very quickly about the, the, the wind, the wind has eased off now, but it was really bad earlier, so if it was interfering with the audio quality on the video, I do apologise. I've got a brand new camera set up now that I'm using, and I've only literally recently got an external mic with all the bells and whistles, but, but I haven't learned how to use it yet, well, obviously. Um, so I need a whole day just to kind of work that out, but that'll be very soon. But I do apologise if the audio was a little bit muffled. So, what are we going to do now? We're going to... Give the structure a once over uh, and I, actually I want to show you what we're going to do because we're going to sort out the dowels on the structure. Dowels, oh I like dowels, yeah. So these dowels here that, um, <laughs> it was a steep learning curve making these dowels I tell you, gosh, we messed quite a few up, all part of the uh, learning process, uh, but we kind of got there in the end towards the latter part of the build, we kind of nailed it, right? So there's still obviously room for improvement. But what it is now, and then obviously all the dowels are kind of sticking out, all different kind of like lengths and depths and all the other ends. What we want to do now is, I'm thinking about a couple of centimetres out. <laughs> That's what she said. Behave. So a couple of centimetres out, trim it off, uh, maybe chamfer it a little bit. I don't think there's going to be any need for it. But before I do that, I just need to get the hammer, just give these a little tap in once more. Um, because obviously over time, as it kind of dries even more, the wood, it kind of like creaks and it kind of moves around a little bit uh, but most of them seem quite sturdy but just a quick final tap to double check that all the dowels are going in as much as they can then I want to just saw them off uh, roughly about two centimeters jutting out so I don't want to do it too flush you know so in the future if we have to tap it in a little bit more um, so let's just do that let's go and clean up all the dowels so the hammer I'm using is not just any ordinary hammer bought from some cheap DIY store this was actually gifted to me by a dear friend of mine, Moleskin Joe. John, from the west of England, Hereford. And he very kindly, he was stopping off in London for some work, which is quite a bit of a distance. And he very, very kindly stopped off and gifted me a load of antique tools. And it's all British tools. So this is a hickory handle. The writing's there, but it's really difficult to make out. It's a beautiful hand forged hammer, White House, that's what it's called. Hickory handle, there you go man. So this needs a bit of refurbishment. And what I'm gonna do at a later date is I'm actually gonna clean up all the heads of these hammers. He gifted me a load of chisels and uh, screwdrivers and augers, a bit of brace and a whole bunch of stuff. All really, really high quality. Stuff you just can't get anymore. Um, so that was extremely kind of him. So there you go man, using an antique hammer. Yeah, okay, let's just get cutting. So there you go, the dowels are all being pinged in. Um, some of them did move a little bit, uh, a couple did actually move quite a bit, but the rest of them seemed quite sturdy where they were. But it was good just to give it a once over. Now, I want to introduce you to Stanley. Stanley! There you go, Stanley. I was going to use my backhoe, lap down the saw, it's a, bit too, um, it's a bit too coarse in terms of the, uh, the saw blades, and I wanted some a little bit finer. Okay, to give it a bit of a cleaner finish. I've got a Japanese pull saw. That's a bit, a li little bit too, too delicate for this kind of work. So I thought, okay, bring out the man's toys. Now, where's the man? So like I said, I'm going to leave about two centimetres out. Don't want to go kind of too far in. That's what she said. Right.
There you go, it's much better. See what I mean? It just gives it a bit more of a finer finish. Backer would have been a bit too rough, but that's perfect. So they've all been sawn off, all the dowels. There's some a little bit sentimental, because I thought maybe I'll tidy up a little bit in terms of chamfering, like the, the ends of it. Check this out. Do you know what this is? It's a moor. That's it. I need to pronounce it properly, otherwise my Scandinavian friends are going to shoot me. This is the classic. You know, the cheap classic. You pick it up for like 10, 15 pounds or 10, 15 bucks, whatever your currency is. This was actually my first ever knife. I've had this for over three years now. Can you believe that? That's insane. Like three and a half years I've had this for. Uh, I actually lent it out to someone. They had it for quite a while. And I got it back not too long ago. It's amazing these knives. I mean, yeah, I've got some, I'm very honored. You know, I've got some, some amazing knives. You know, a Jackalow knife and uh, um, I've got one by Scott or Wessex Blaze. I've got one by Chiro's Knives. Uh, uh, I've got one by Virtus Knives. I've got a few knives, not loads, but I've got a few beautiful handcrafted knives but it's funny this one here is like no matter how old it is or how kind of cheap it is it's still an amazing knife for its price yeah i'm always getting asked you know questions about knives you know what knife shall i get and this is coming more so from those that are relatively new to the whole kind of bushcraft and outdoor space and i say hands down you should go for the mora you know it's cheap um you're not worried about kind of like messing around with it and just potentially kind of ruining the edge or doing whatever with it. Uh, but it's just 10, 15 bucks, you know. Something happens to it, you can just get another one. But you'll find these are quite resilient. I've done all sorts to these right over the years. Still fine, you know, the edge is a little bit kind of worse for wear, right? But it's nothing, a bit of a shine and a polish won't do. I haven't used this in ages. And I found it um, in my kit when I was packing for this day out. And I thought, oh my God, let's just take that out. So yeah, bit of sentimental um, value there, the Mora, but still an amazing knife for the price. There you go. As with everything, safety is paramount. See what YouTube channel you recognize that from. So obviously you always want to be working to, uh, away from yourself. This could definitely do it a shot, this Mora. It's butchered up like there's no tomorrow. But yeah, as long as you're just doing it towards your, uh, away from yourself, sorry. It is all good. Oh, hello. Can you see all my grey hairs? That's what happens when I don't shave and trim my beard. I look like a bloody Sasquatch. I'm going to collect his pension from the post office. So more importantly, all the dowels have been tapped in, they've been uh, sawn off, and they've been sham chamfered off. Yeah, that's it. So, there's one lesson actually I learned. Uh, with making these dowels that was shared by my buddies over at Bushcraft Heroes, an amazing channel. British guys living out in Canada, living the dream, building like a super shelter. That's the super, super, super shelter. So let me quickly show you kind of the, um, the lesson that they taught me with making these dowels to make them even stronger. So initially, so this is a bit that's kind of sawn off, okay. So this is a dowel, obviously we auger the hole, right, into the wood. Uh, we trim some hardwood down, we shaped up the dowels as rough as we can, that we found out over time the kind of thickness that we need to do in order to get it in and give it a good tight fit. Um, and we learned that at the end of the, uh, the dowels, you kind of just chamfer them off quite a bit. So when you're tapping them in, they don't fray out like they've done here. This is one of the earlier models. Okay, can you see that uh, fraying out? So we learned by chamfering them down quite a bit, they don't fray out. So there's a lot of lessons learned, even just making dowels. 
But the guys over at Bushcraft Heroes shared a really cool lesson with me that on the next time round, I'm definitely going to do. And that's to reinforce it. So imagine this now has gone into your hole. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the amount of innuendos I could do right now, but I'm going to stave off. I'm going to be professional about this. So what we do here at Z Outdoors, we're a professional outfit. That's what I tell people. So the lesson they taught me is the following. I'm going to try and show it here. So this is the, the bit that's poking out. What they taught me was if you saw a line in the middle, okay, right in the middle, and you carve out a, a bit of a wedge, and then what you do is you basically just tap it in. So it's like putting an axe head on. And what that does is, so while this is in the hole, technically when you tap this in all the way, this obviously splits that open, um, and then obviously it just gives it a much tighter wedge, and so you know, it's basically just not gonna come out. And there you go, those are the lessons that they taught me. So for next time around, I'm definitely going to attempt that. But yeah, thanks to those guys over there, Matt and Boo. And we've got a Canadian sweatshop as well. Poor Canadian guys working away while them two do all the filming. I'll see what you do. I know what your game is. So anyway, that's the lesson that they taught me with the Dells to make it even stronger. So as is always the case with this build, lessons learned continuously throughout the whole process. So there you go, all chamfered off, all of them. It's not going to be perfect, just going to be clean up. Just taking these sharp edges off. Now what I have done, is I've left all the top ones on, shutting out. Especially at the back, because I'll tell you why, moving forward when the shelter's complete, the sides are in, the roof is on, you can use these to hang your stuff off. So a lot of people have mentioned that, but it is something we were thinking about anyway, as we were building it. But we're going to add loads more in. For example, this central pillar, most likely will just put dowels all the way down. So we can hang this stuff off. Obviously off the roof as well. Um, but yeah, the top ones I've kind of left jutting out. But yeah, the bottom ones, chamfered off in Chamfer City. Two and a half inches, is that it? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> That's slightly awkward. So here's the thing, guys. I've got to measure up now the size. I've already got the measurements written down, but I'm just in the process of ordering and kind of making sure I have all the pieces ready to put the sides in, okay? So I want to just double check because obviously there's been a little bit of movement in the shelter since the last time we've been here. So I want to double check those measurements, get those written down and then I want to make sure I get all the right pieces from this woodland and from another couple of woodlands surrounding this area because it is approaching felling season now um, and so I'm really going to try and source the best wood I can. This woodland's really difficult unless I start chopping stuff down, which I don't want to do. Um, it's very difficult as I have to go further afield to kind of source the wood, but it is what it is. Um, obviously, the only wood we've chopped down so far is the stuff that's dangerous, that's kind of dead hanging stuff. Uh, but apart from that, anything live, I don't want to cut it down. I really, really want to avoid that. So there you go. Let me get measuring. Two and a half inches. Must be joking. definitely been a bit of movement in the wood that's what she said so friends it's all been measured up now because of the tumultuous weather we've had over the past two three months the structure has moved slightly but it's more settled down so it's a good thing I've measured it up so now when I source all the side pieces to go along the sides uh, then obviously now I've got much more clearer measurements now with the size what I'm going to be doing is sourcing primarily hardwoods leave the bark on, I don't need to take the bark off and what I'm going to do is just putting them upright and then just putting cross beams kind of down then just to hold it in place without them kind of moving to one side and that's really what I'm going to be doing and keeping it quite simple so for the next two three weeks sourcing that it's going to be a little bit difficult from this woodland as I mentioned already I don't want to start chopping wood down uh, but it is felling season so there are woodlands local to here and surrounding areas where I will be able to source it so there you go that is that done cleared the area up cleared all the dead for done everything now the last thing we want to do is discuss roofing roofing is something I've had to put a lot of thought into and I actually want to get a bit of a discussion going with you guys to let me know what your thoughts are so let's have a look at the roof first as it is and I'll give you my ideas or we can start a bit of a discussion as to what you think is the best way forward roofing <laughs> roofing <laughs> so here's where we're at at the moment so obviously the sides I'm going down this side here along the back and along the side here now what we're going to be doing on the roof here's what my idea is see at the moment this front beam here apologies about the lighting 
still going to be secured on and this middle one still going to be secured on as well at the moment you can see here so that's a bit difficult in the light we've just tied it down with a bit of rope um, but that's all going to be secured down now here's what the idea is from Mr Z Outdoors it is the following I swear that farmer's aiming for me you know Freaking, who's that dodgy looking brown bloke over there right so here's what Mr Z Outdoors plan is so at the moment you can see the roof strut here so what I'm going to be doing is basically continuing the struts along here right so it's just kind of just imagine they're going all along there and what I'm going to be doing at the top I've never mentioned this before but what I've concluded is I'm going to use cedar bark strips now uh, I showed it in a previous video where I visited my chums over at Wilderness Pioneers based in Oxford and they've got a technique based on primitive techniques which is to use cedar bark strips and it's like terracotta tiles where they all kind of fold into each other and so the rain goes off so that's basically my goal at the moment However, sourcing cedar bark strips, it's not as easy as it seems, right? Especially in the UK, because it's not that common. But have no fear, I'm still gonna be sourcing that. So that's question number one. If you know someone legally, and I uh, stress legally, in the southeast, uh, in the London and surrounding areas that can get hold of good quality cedar bark strips, uh, freshly taken off, or just see the bark that's been going to be uh, felled, or has recently been felled, that I can once again legally go there and take it off then please do send me a pm and let me know uh, like i said it's got to be legal i've said that about three times now because i have had some people that obviously mean well but they're basically telling me to go to like a you know a privately owned woodland or a council owned woodland to take it down and i'm not going to be doing that so if you know anyone let me know however there are a couple of options that i have been looking at now people have been talking about birch bark using birch bark problem in the uk the birch bark is simply not good enough so there's no way i'm going to be able to use birch bark it's just way too thin and you can't get decent strips out of it uh, the other option is cladding so people getting kind of the mud and kind of wedging that in i could potentially look at that um, but i think it's going to add on quite a bit of weight to that I did look at shingle, shingle making. And apart from getting shot again, the shingle making, the problem with that is I grossly, grossly underestimate how much work is, invo uh, is involved. Be it making it from sweet chestnut or from oak, it is a lot of work involved in shingle making. Uh, and plus I need to lay the foundation of the roof in a particular way. Um, and if I did it, I'm not joking, I've spoken to a professional guy who does this basically for a living. He really knows his stuff. Uh, and he said it'll take me about three weeks every single day to make it. And that's if you know what you're doing. So I grossly underestimated. However, I will be doing shingle making for a side shelter here. So on the side of this, what I'm gonna be doing is making, yay, about, I say about a two foot of an extension going out. Uh, and what I'm gonna be doing there is using that for a wood store uh, and sort of got a few of the kind of woodworking tools that I'm going to be building at this site, like a chop, multi-purpose chopping block, pole lathe, etc. Um, so that is what I'm potentially going to be doing. But shingles is just completely out of the equation for the main roof. There's just no way I can do it. Once again, I've grossly underestimated the time it will take. There is one other option that I don't know too much about, and once again, I want to ask you guys, and that is thatching okay the traditional art of thatching now i don't know too much about it i've seen it being done on tv uh, i've yet to see it being done on person um, in terms of like the process being done in person uh, and obviously i've seen it on buildings in the uk especially when you go to the rural areas you see so many properties with thatch roofing you know so that's a very common site and the things i haven't seen the process being done in person and i don't know how practical it is to do it on this roof i'm not ruling it out but if you guys know more about it than I do and the feasibility of it, or even if someone is up for doing it with me, if I don't get shot by the farmer, then let me know. Let me know via PM. You know, I'm really up for it. But it is something I'm going to be looking into as a, a potential solution to do the roofing. So as a recap, I've got to rule out shingles. I've got to rule out birch bark. Um, I can't just kind of put, um, just kind of like clamps of wood together. Um, hoping that will stick you know, it, you know the, the rain will get through and I want something that's natural 100% handmade uh, and completely waterproof so as I uh, said earlier on cedar bark is most likely the route I'm going to go down um, if you know where I can source that legally let me know but thatching thatching is a potential solution that I could explore 
if I've left anything else out, let me know. Let me know if there's viable solutions of what I could do to do this roof naturally without any artificial uh, materials and um, making sure it's 100% waterproof. The one thing you've got to remember is the weight, the weight of the roof. Um, so you can have some great suggestions and people have given some suggestions in the past, but you've got to think about the weight, the weight going down on the roof structure. Um, so the structure is okay, it's pretty strong, but it's not like super strong. We can start putting loads of weight on it to make it waterproof. So it's something to consider. So there you go, let me know your thoughts people. Now the one thing I have done is as a temporary, because for the next, I would say a couple of months, until I get the roof 100% done, the sides will be done over the coming weeks, uh, as well as the fire pit, um, the fire reflector, uh, and a few other bits and bobs. But the roof ain't gonna be done for a couple of months, because that's basically when I'm gonna be able to source the materials. Um, because I've gotta wait for spring, basically, right? Uh, when the sap's rising, that's when you can take the bark off. So, the one thing I have done is I spoke to a buddy of mine in the UK, um, a good buddy of mine, a fellow YouTuber who does a lot of great canvas and leather work, um, and I've commissioned a tarp from him. And what I'm going to be doing is temporarily using that tarp, it's a heavy duty canvas tarp, using that as a temporary roofing for the here and now. Um, but then once the actual permanent roofing is done, that tarp is not going to go to waste because I'm going to use it as an awning in front of the shelter rain, which is very common in the UK. Um, if we get in that and it's obviously copious amounts of rain, it gives me a lot more kind of like work area. So you have like the shelter and obviously the awning will kind of go all the way in front and give you a lot more work area. Uh, and obviously the fire can still be underneath, it's a canvas type so it's not going to affect it. So I have ordered that and I should be getting that pretty soon. So even as a temporary measure, I do have some roofing, but obviously I want something more permanent, more natural uh, moving forward. So there you go, waiting for that tarp to come through, which I'm pretty excited about. So there you go guys, I apologise it's not a huge amount that's happened in this video that's incredibly exciting but really it's been about three months since I've been to this site, it was important we clear it up after the storms and really bad weather we've had over the, winter, the uh, late autumn and winter period and we've done that now, the site's a lot more clean, we've got the wood all piled up, sorted out which has satisfied my OCD. I've taken the measurements again, I've cleaned up the dowels, I've checked over the structure, um, and I've just kind of reassessed exactly what's going to be done now. So over the next two, three weeks, I'm going to be sourcing the remainder of the materials, which is going to be the size of the shelter. Uh, I'm also in the process of locking down a couple of different blacksmiths. So I'm going to choose which one's going to be working out the best for me. Logistically, for to come down, for him to come down with a mobile forger, and we forge a pot hanging system. And once that's done, they're also going to build a bunk bed at the back of the shelter as you do right um, so I'm looking forward to that and that will be happening over the coming weeks so I apologize about the kind of lack of videos over the autumn winter period Z Outdoors is a big passion of mine I don't even like to call it a hobby it's a big big passion of mine however it is just that um, it's not my business I don't use I don't uh, rely on it for income anything I do make which is very little covers my fuel expenses and if anything covers uh, has covered my new camera equipment even then not fully right um, so I stress I do apologize you know for kind of lapses in content but I do genuinely try to make it when I can um, and I do try to be consistent where possible before you do see a bit of a lapse in content the reality is I run my own business and that really just takes up a lot of my time so there you go my apologies so hope you enjoy what you have seen so far a reminder as always to follow me on Instagram I'm very active on Instagram the search for Z Outdoors, the moment you see some dodgy looking brown bloke with a broken nose, that's it, you know you found me. Can you see that? So there you go. So follow me on there and I hope you've all been keeping well. A very belated uh, happy Christmas and happy New Year's. I hope whatever you got planned for 2018 is also an adventurous one for you as well, regardless of your situation or whether you're able to get out or not. And I look forward to seeing you on the next instalment. I have some pretty cool stuff planned over the coming weeks, which I hope you're going to enjoy and the show is really gonna to start to take shape now. So as always, please leave me your suggestions on things I've discussed throughout this video down below in the comments. If you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. This is Zed from Zed Outdoors. Peace out.